Hi, my name is Jen. Welcome to Warp 4. Today I'm going to tell you about the Essex. The, or, well, it's just Essex, but I will probably lapse into calling it the Essex. It's not, the name is not the Essex, it's just Essex. Essex was a whaling ship. It was 87 feet and 7 inches long by 20 foot wide. So that's 27.6 meters long by 7.3 meters wide. The Essex was launched in 1799 in Massachusetts in the USA. At the point in the life of the Essex that we're talking about, the ship was about 20 years old and it had had many successful and profitable voyages uh, to the point even where Essex was considered to be lucky. Essex had recently been refitted and completed another successful voyage. That was very recent. Both of those things happened. Essex was actually thought to be small for a whaling ship at only about 88 feet or um, 27 meters long. It wasn't thought to be, you know, huge or anything like that, which to me, um, that seems huge. We have a couple boats and none of them are over about 30 feet long, so, and those are good size to me. <laughs> In August of 1819, the captain was a fellow named George Pollard Jr., and he was 29 years old. Seemed young. Uh, the first mate was Owen Chase. He was 23, and there was a 14-year-old cab cabin boy <laughs> named Thomas Nickerson. So the crew was 21 men in total, um, mostly white, but there were also three black men on the crew. On August 12, 1819, Ex Essex and the crew departed from Nantucket to head for whaling grounds off of the west coast of South America. They were expecting a two-and-a-half-year voyage. Um, wow. Two-and-a-half years. That seems like a lot. Um, I guess maybe that's why they were younger people, because maybe they didn't have families who would miss them. Like, you know what I mean? They hadn't had children of their own and gotten all married up, maybe? I don't know. Because um, that's, that's a long time to, to be away from loved ones. A few days into the trip, they were hit by a sudden squall. Um, a squall is basically a sudden increase in wind, often accompanied by, like, rain or a thunderstorm. Um, this happens to them while they are in the Gulf Stream, which is a warm, fast-moving ocean current that stretches along the uh, U.S. East Coast. The squall knocked the Essex around and the top gallant sail, or the sail that's above the top sail, which I don't know why they don't just say that, was lost. Two of the smaller whale boats aboard were completely destroyed and a third one had damages. Uh, Captain Pollard decided that he was just going to power through though, so they, they continued and they didn't replace the boats or make any repairs. After about five weeks, in January of 1820, they came around Cape Horn. Um, where the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans meet. Five weeks was a long time for them to only just now be at this point, and the crew was beginning to feel stressed between that and the squall. Nevertheless, they began to hunt in the South Pacific, up the western coast of South America to present-day Ecuador, um, what was then Roycel Audience de Quito, I believe. I may have that all wrong, and if I'm butchering these names, I am really sorry. Uh, when whales were sighted, they would leave three men on board to look after the Essex, and then the other 18 would split into groups of six to each boat, to each whale boat, the smaller boats. Each one was led by one of the officers, who were, of course, Captain Pollard, um, Owen Chase, and a, another man named Matthew Joy, who was the second mate. Chase was first mate. Um, by September of 1820, a guy by the name of DeWitt deserted at Atacamas on Ecuador's northern Pacific coast. This was pretty not awesome for the rest of the crew, because um, each whale boat, like I said, needed six men, and three back on the Essex was considered bare minimum. They supposed that now they would just have to, um, two would have to do back on the Essex, um, they'd have to do what they had to do, uh, even though two was insufficient, considered insufficient. The crew wasn't finding many whales to hunt in the area anymore, um, but they did come across some other whalers, and that crew told Essex of an offshore ground to hunt that was located about 2,500 nautical miles to the south and west. That's a hell of a long ways, and there were rumors um, of islands out in the South Pacific that were home to cannibals. But what else was there to do? Where they were currently hunting was pretty depleted. It seemed like it was time to move on. So the crew takes Essex to an island in the Galapagos called Charles Island. Um, or it was then. Now it's called Floriana. 
uh, they first came upon Hood Island, um, which is now called Espanola Island, and anchored off to fix a leak. They also caught 300 Galapagos giant, giant tortoises for food, and then moved on to Charles Island, where they caught 60 more. Uh, some species of giant Galapagos tortoise are now extinct, by the way. Um, and I think of one of the subspecies, uh, there's one known to be alive. Um, I don't know. Uh, you can Google that if you want more information on that. So it's, a, it's a rough thing. But mind, they also left many of these poor turtles alive on the ship to be slaughtered as needed for food. Um, so they have tortoises weighing somewhere between 100 and 800 pounds just clunking, clunking about on board somewhere, I guess. I don't know. In my mind, they're just crawling all over this 88-foot <laughs> boat. Um, but anyway, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with pounds uh, in kilograms, that's between 45 and 363 kilograms. So large, large creatures. While they were hunting on Charles Island, some idiot helmsman named Thomas Chapel set a fire, thinking it would be a funny prank. Fire, however, does what fire wants, and the hunters had to run through it to escape, and before long, most of the island was ablaze. Good job, dumbass. <laughs> the next day, they were sailing for the offshore grounds, and it was still burning and visible at the horizon, even after a few days' sail. The crew finally reached the offshore grounds, but saw no whales until the 16th of November, when one surfaced directly beneath Owen Chase's boat and busted it to pieces. So on the morning of November 20th, spouts were sighted, and the men took to the boats to chase down the whales. On the leeward side, leeward being downwind, you know, whichever whichever way it is, it's downwind. And the boat that Chase was in actually harp harpooned a whale, but it whacked the boat, like tail smacked it, I guess, and split a seam. So they had to call it quits and head back to Essex to repair it. Two miles windward, or upwind, from where Essex was, Joy and Pollard's boats had each harpooned whales and were being kind of pulled even further from, from Essex towards the horizon. Chase, meanwhile, He's still on the, on the Essex, working to repair the smaller boat that he was in that was damaged earlier when it took the whale tail whack. Yeah. <laughs> Around this time, the crew spots like a big-ass 85-foot or 22-meter long sperm whale. So mind you, they're, the boat that they're in, the Essex itself, is only 88 feet, I think I said. So um, that's, that's a big, big whale. But it was kind of just sitting at the surface, like facing the bow of the ship. Never mind what was going through the minds of the crew. What do you think was going through that whale's mind, just sitting there staring at that ship? Uh, we don't have to wonder too much. Um, the whale was thinking something like, I challenge you to a duel. Because that's when it started swimming right towards the ship. It went just a bit below the surface, picked up speed, went even faster, and rammed the Essex. And then the whale surfaced on the ship's starboard or right-hand side with its head toward the bow and its tail at the stern. Owen Chase thought about harpooning the whale uh, while it was sitting there just chilling, but it did occur to him that that whale might start thrashing about and damage the rudder or sink the boat entirely. Um, if the rudder was damaged, then of course they'd be out there in the middle of nowhere with no way to steer the ship. So he hesitated, uh, wisely I guess. Um, so the whale swam off ahead of the bow of the Essex, 500 or more yards ahead, before it turned to again face the bow. Then the whale just swam forward and smashed headfirst into the bow and pushed the ship backwards. The whale then just swam off. It's like mission accomplished. I won the duel and it swam off. Owen Chase and the other members of the crew went pretty hard trying to rig the whale boat and... Um, a guy named William Bond went to gather whatever navigational aids he could find on the ship. The captain's whaleboat was the first to return to Essex, and the ship was already taking on water from the smashed bow, and it was located roughly 2,000 nautical miles west of South America. The crew spent a few days scavenging the wreck of all that could be useful and piled it into three, the three whaleboats. Um, the food and water that they had available was pretty far from being adequate for the number of people. They had found two sets of navigational equipment and charts, and Captain Pollard's boat had one, and Owen Chase's boat had the other. Uh, Matthew Joy, he had fuck all in the way of navigational aids, and he just had to kind of like keep up and follow the other two boats. 
Um, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> the closest known islands were the Marquesas. There are 15 of them apparently out there, but they were at least 1,200 miles or 19 kilometers, 1,900 kilometers, I'm sorry, west. The captain wanted to head there, but Mr. Chase and the rest of the crew were afraid that the islands were inhabited by cannibals, so they voted to continue east, to head east. <clears throat> they couldn't, however, sail against the trade winds. The trade winds are permanent east to west winds, um, kind of near the equator. So they had, they, their plan was they were going to sail a thousand miles or 1600 kilometers south first to hit the westerlies. The westerlies are like anti-trade winds, which go from west to east. Um, at which point, then they could head uh, the roughly 3,000 miles that it would take, or 4,800 4, kilometers, to South America, east to South America. So from the onset, they were rationing their food and water. Um, a majority of their food had been doused in seawater, and eating it kind of only made them thirsty thirstier. Um, about two weeks in, they were out of food and drinking their own urine. The whale boats weren't exactly intended for voyages thousands of miles across the open ocean, so leaks were a thing. Storms and rough seas kept them pretty busy. A month after a whale bashed Essex on December 20th, the boats landed on an uninhabited raised coral atoll in the Pitcairn Islands. They found a freshwater spring and they kind of went nuts eating birds, crabs, eggs, pepperweed, whatever they could find. They, they were just scalping this island. And after about a week of this, there really wasn't much, much left. They, they figured they'd starve if they stayed, and three of them decided that they were just going to stay anyway and take their chances on the atoll. The three were Seth Week, William Wright, and Thomas Chappell. If you recall, Thomas Chappell was the firebug who thought it would be funny to set an island on fire previously as a joke or prank. Not that it matters, but that was him. <laughs> the other 17 men hopped back into the whale boats on December 27th and hoped to get to Easter Island. By the 4th of January, they figured that they had drifted too far south to reach Easter Island, so they decided instead to head for Mas a Tierra. Yep, island. And that was still about 1,800 miles or 2,900 kilometers east. So they still had quite a ways to go. And if they, if they made it that far to that island, they were still 419 miles or 674 kilometers from the coast of South America. So hell of a journey, right? Matthew Joy, who was the second mate, had been in not so great health even before he left Nantucket. Stressing, starving, and dehydrating really didn't help. Uh, it didn't help at all. And as you can imagine, he just got worse. He was the first to die on the 10th of January. He was sewn into his clothes and buried at sea. A man named Obed Hendricks took um, took on the leadership of Matthew Joy's boat. So Obed Hendricks is now um, like head honcho on that boat. The next day, Owen Chase's boat got separated from the other two in a squall. And mind you, I think, isn't, wasn't he one of the ones that had the navigational stuff? Yeah. Uh, Richard Peterson died on January 18th, and he was buried at sea. On the 8th of February, Isaac Cole died, and he was not buried at sea. The crew that was left alive on Chase's boat had a little talk and resorted to cannibalism. So that's why Isaac was not buried at sea. Hendrix and Pollard's boats were still together, and when Hendrix's boat ran out of food on January 14th, Pollard actually shared what remained of his boat's supply. That's kind of cool of him. Uh, they all ran out of food on January 21st, though. A man had died on Hendrix's boat the day before, and they kept his body for food. Another died on the 23rd, and another on the 27th, and another on the 28th. Um, then Hendrix's boat got separated, and the three men left alive on board were never seen again. So we don't know what happened to that one. But back on Pollard's boat, food ran out again on February 1st. They drew lots to see who would be shot and eaten, and then they drew lots once more to see who would do the shooting. Charles Ramsdale, I think I'm saying that right, was going to be shooting Owen Coffin, and he did. On the 14th of February, 
Bezali Bezali Ray also died, and so only Pollard and Ramsdale were left on that boat. Chase's boat, the one that had been separated in the squall, ran out of food again on the 15th of February. On February 18th, off the coast of Chile, the three survivors in that boat were spotted by a British ship called Indian and were rescued. They had been at sea for 89 days. Pollard and Ramsdale were almost to South America when they were spotted by a Nantucket whaler called Dolphin. Not dolphin like porpoise, but dolphin like the dolphin of France. Um, <laughs> and the three dudes who stayed behind on that uninhabited atoll, they were scooped up by a merchant, merchant vessel called Surrey. Um, is that not incredible? Like all of it? Pollard had tried going out whaling again after his rescue, I guess when he recouped, but he wrecked at least once, and then he wrecked again on a merchant vessel, so he kind of got a reputation for being unlucky. He ended up being a night watchman uh, for Nantucket and died at the age of 78 on January 7th, 1870. Owen Chase, on the other hand, he wrote a book about the shipwreck, and he continued at sea for another 19 years, and he retired in 1840. The whale attack on Essex, by the way, inspired the novel Moby Dick by Herman Melville. So um, that's kind of how I heard of it. Uh, for references, I pretty much just used Wikipedia. So yeah, that's the tale. It's crazy, right? Anyway, you can look for our socials down below if you're interested. If you want to reach out to us, you can shoot us an email. We are warpedlore at gmail.com. But yeah, that's it. That's what I have for you today. Thank you for watching and come hang out with us again soon. Bye.